Welcome to Oakham Bros. This is Eric. And I'm Michael. And we have a very, very special guest today. We have with us a friend of mine, Ryan Colucci, producer, screenwriter. What other hats do you wear, dude? I mean, you, you, like, you're living the dream because like, that's all we want to do is like, get into fucking Hollywood. And like, be, and do what you're doing. And it was easy, doing. right? It was easy. It was, it's just, it was, easy. It was, it was yeah. no problem. Still very easy. Yeah, you just like landed in LA. You're like, Ryan Colucci here. I'm ready. Let's go. And Hollywood's like, you're in. That's it. It's a done deal. Uh, that's Take, what I thought. <laughs> that's, that's what we all think. That's what we all think. I, I got to tell you a real quick story. We, I was with Ryan. We were, you were there too. We were there for John, our, friend, my, our mutual friend, John Goldstein. He was having a bachelor party in Vegas. And I was sitting across from Ryan. We were at Smith & Walensky's, I think. Right? Did we do we went to Smith and Walensky's? Was that the restaurant? Oh, it was a steakhouse. I forget which one. I think probably. It, I, I'm pretty sure it was Smith and Walensky's. It was on the strip, and it was great. The boys were there. It was just incredible. And it was like my first time actually hanging out with you and your brother Chris, who I've known for like three decades now, which is just unbelievable to even think about. Um, you know, you, you know, my brother. You're, you're like, oh, Chris is like, this is my brother Ryan, and he's in Hollywood, and he's an insider, and he's making it big, and. I'm like, oh, cool. And like the first thing you think of was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I'm sure people are like, you know, you know, dr dreamers instead of doers. And you said to me, and I'll never forget this. You're like, I was at a club the other day and Justin Timberlake is dating Britney Spears. And this is like when Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears were like the it thing. And I'm like, this kid's full of shit. Justin Timberlake's not dating Britney Spears. This kid doesn't know what he's talking about. And like two days later in the fucking papers, it comes out that, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> okay, so I that's like remember that. I, I I remember it like it was yesterday, and I wouldn't make that shit up. You, you know, and that's not me being a Hollywood insider. My roommate, uh, who I went to high school with, Holy Trinity in Hicksville on Long Island, he yeah. was like an actor model. I mean, still is, but he worked the door at whatever the hottest club in LA was. Right, he would just jump and work the door there. So I mean. I, it wasn't like, hey, I was some uh, big swinging, you know, jerk. I, I, I would just, I'd be able to like kind of walk in the employee entrance where there's a big <laughs> mob outside. So I'd be at the bar, like friends with all the bartenders and stuff by that point, um, mostly by myself until he finished and then he'd come in. But, um, you know, at the some of the craziest, and this is before cell phone videos were a thing. Right. So everyone, right. once you were behind closed doors, you get kind of crazy. Um, we saw some, you know, we hung out with some cool people and saw some crazy stuff. Um, but that was more uh, an offshoot of that. And here I thought you were, cool. and here I thought you were like, like you were running with that crowd. That's that's really funny. I mean, I, like I've been to both of their houses after hours, um, just because by the time it is ready to leave, there's only a few people still inside the club. And right. It's like the people that work there and the you know celebrities so you're just confirming um, so, everybody's dreams that it that it is a non-stop party and you're visiting celebrities houses and yeah it was awesome yeah <laughs> it was that's, awesome that's, and that's I, amazing. I did it on almost zero dollars like <laughs> right i was i was so, in, I, mean, uh, I was at grad school at usc i went to the peter stark program which is their producing program right um and that's when i got off the plane thinking not you know, I actually had never been to LA, not, not even been to, Cal really? I hadn't been west of Colorado. Um, wow. I spent most of my time playing lacrosse. That's why he probably never met me. Um, right. Even though my brother is a year older, he hung out with all the kids my age in Syosset. Right. Whereas I was never home. Uh, I played college lacrosse and then I played kind of professionally here and there. I was trying to at least. Right. And then I ruptured my kidney. Oh and my as God. I was in, sitting in the ICU, got into the Stark program at USC. So when I was able to walk again, I went from 190 pounds to like 140. Jesus Christ. Uh, I lost so much blood. I had like six or seven blood transfusions. Right. But I, was, I made it through. I got out in August and I had, I, I started walking and maybe a week later. And, I, and when I started walking up, my mom or dad had to like hold me and cause I was just oh so my weak. God. A week later, I was on a plane to LA for the first time um, and I had class that Monday. Right. They said, if you're not here for the first day of class, your spot's gone. And there's you're only out, 25 right. kids, kids a year that um, get in out of, you know, a few thousand applicants. So 
that's why I was like, all right, I'm a hot shot now. I got into this program. But on the first day of the program, the guy who runs it, Larry Turman, who's a legendary producer, he did the graduate and things like right. that. He says, you know, you can take a look around right now. A third of you will run this industry. A third of you will have jobs in this industry. And a third of you won't work in this industry in three years. Oh, my God. Um, and every year, it's pretty correct. Right. Least, um, Why did you how did you, yeah, but yeah, like, how, you did, you, her, how did you stick that out? Because that's like, that's like this that's like what you assume that happens and like like what was so after school what did you do well so the reason i chose stark and producing yeah uh over you know i knew that i wanted to be directing but i had right. a finance background i went to villanova to play lacrosse and uh, i didn't go to school to learn something i went to school to play lacrosse um and the hardest major there was accounting i had an a in it so right. I was like, well, it's, this is easy for me. I'll just be an accounting major. So I was in the commerce and finance department. I wound up with a background in finance, essentially. Uh, I spent a year at Cambridge in England studying economics and political science, but I came back and um, that's when I knew I wanted to be doing film. I was like, you know, I, I don't want to wake up at 40 as a tax right. attorney or, or doing, doing something like that. Um, you know, I feel like I'd be wasting my time. Right. And I was sitting at Cambridge, like, I guess I'm a pretty smart human being. I'm here. Uh, it's one of the best schools in the world. Maybe right. I can do anything I want. So right. I started looking into grad programs for film. And a lot of them were directing programs. And there's really only a few that matter, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other ones you're getting taught by people who have never even made a film or things like that. Right. And yeah, you have access to their equipment, but like, what good is it if you don't know how to use it? Um, you're essentially, you're teaching yourself. And a lot of film is, is self-taught anyway. There's only so much someone can teach you. Right. Uh, it's not like other jobs where you kind of come up the ladder and you eventually get to the point where you say, all right, I'm ready. Right. Um, well, either, you're either, got it, either you got it or you don't. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I, people on my sets all the time, and I'm kind of jumping around, but people on my sets all the time, first AD, second ADs. I'm like, what do you want to do? And these are guys in their thirties. Right. Oh, I want to be a director. So why are you on my set right now as a second AD? Well, you know, I'm kind of coming up the ladder. I'm like, that's not how it works. Right. You either go direct or you're going to be a below the line person your whole 100%, life. 100%. You, know, you can, I, I spent a lot of time um, in my twenties looking at credits and I would, study credit, like it sounds so stupid, but I would study credits and look up those people on IMDb, right. like the first AD, the line producer, things like that. And, and it's, they, their careers don't transition to director or producer. Mm -hmm. um, usually it transitions up that first AD ladder or up the below the line ladder, gaffer, grips, and up to DPs, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, w wait a second, that, that, there's a disconnect there. That's not what I want to do. And a lot of the, even USC, their production program for the uh, masters, mm -hmm. which is their directing program, not everyone gets to direct. Mm -hmm. The same with NYU. And those are the two I looked at. Uh, Columbia to some extent too. But with USC, uh, you could wind up in there pay, paying fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year and mm -hmm. never direct a minute in grad school. Uh, it's all kind of, and I don't want to say merit-based because it's not necessarily merit-based, it's all subjective, right? Um, right? So whether or not you direct isn't even up to you. You can wind up key gripping a bunch of grad thesis films. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, this makes absolutely zero sense to me. I have a finance background. I, I researched the Stark program. It's the crown jewel of USC's grad program mm -hmm. and their film school. And I was like, you know what? What I'm going to do is, this is the only grad school I'm going to apply to. It's really the only producing school in, in the world. Right. U UCLA and AFI have producing schools, but, um, and like no disrespect to them, those people graduate and they're probably doing stuff, but like, they're not on the same level. Right. Um, in terms of every year turning out alumni that are running Hollywood, like Neil Moritz and mm -hmm. um, John August and, and people like that. Um, Bob Greenblatt and, and like some, some people at the top of the food chain, uh, right. which matters because it's all about relationships. 
hundred so percent. My thought was I'm going to apply to Stark and if I get in, awesome. I hit lotto. Mm-hmm. At least I thought at the time, like, oh, I get in and I'm, I'm uh, in, suddenly Welcome a gazillionaire. To- Welcome to Hollywood, baby. It's, yeah, I mean, it's I mean, nothing I, like that. Like fast forwarding, did that did that have any effect on your life after school? Yeah. So the other, what I was going to do was, if I didn't get into Stark, I was going to pack a car, move to LA, and work in the mailroom at an agency because mm-hmm. I thought that was the second best film school for what I, you know, coming up through producing and then um, building up my credits that way uh, mm-hmm. or contacts that way. Uh, so in school, you're in class with 24 other type A personalities that, you know, aren't necessarily slouches that come from some of the best schools in the world. Right. And a lot of those same people, I mean, I had three kids of billionaires in my class. Right. right. So you're talking about 25 kids, three of them for the scions of billionaires. So, uh, you know, I'm not a billionaire. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure my dad's a uh, you know, a millionaire, but, um, right. Like you're exposed to that. Right. And coming out of school, uh, a lot of the kids in my class were, uh, Stark does a good job every year. They put you in the second year is all at night, night Mm -hmm. classes Mm -hmm. so that you can work during the day. Mm -hmm. And that first summer they get you, they place you at paid jobs, right. Uh, at, you, you know, you talk to them and you say, they say, what do you want to do? You say, I want to work in an agency. I want to work at a studio. I want to work for a producer. I want to work as a director's assistant. Um, right. John August is an alumni. He's a big time screenwriter. Yeah. He usually takes, he's Tim Burton's um, guy. He's Tim Burton's yeah. guy. Yep. I'm wrote, a big fan. You know, swing. Yeah. He's, he's awesome. And uh, he's a grad and he's supportive of the program. So all of his assistants are usually star grads. And then all of his assistants go on to be big writers. Um, I got to tell I want to just interrupt you real quick, Ryan. I just want to give you a heads up. Yeah. You know, I write, I've been writing since I was a teenager. I mean, I, we've always spoken about it over the years. Um, and I started, I moved into novels because the scripts were just, it was just like spinning your wheels and I was getting the producers to read them. Um, but I, and then I started, I, I got published and you know, I have a whole publishing career now and um, my, I, my books are, I actually had a call with um, the winner of the Nickel Fellowship Award uh, last year. I don't want to say his name, but uh, he won the Nickel Fellowship Award for his screenplay. And um, he's now going to be turning my book Monsterland into a script and we're going to go out and try and sell it. And the usual process uh, again and again. But um, he went to UCLA and he got an MFA in screenwriting. And I'm always trying to hone my skills, my, my writing skills. And I applied to the UFC uh, online course. Um, to get an MFA in screenwriting and I got accepted. So I'm starting, yeah, I'm starting this September um, uh, to, to take the courses at night. I'm, you know, I'm just going to do it. It's going to take a year and whatever. Um, my attorney who put the Simpsons on air, this woman put SpongeBob on air. This is like a powerhouse attorney. She's like, some people need the school. Some people don't. She's like, I don't think you need it because you're already a published author. And I'm doing it because I'm doing it, number one, to, you know, hone my skills and everything. But I'm also doing it to connect with people and, you know, get connections just like you. Do you feel that you need school to, to break no, in? No, so I, for producing, it's a lot different than screenwriting. It, it, um, please explain the difference because I, I want the audience to hear this. How, how well, like, go ahead, go ahead, well, please. Well, the way, the, like, producers traditionally um, – you know, find a project, develop that project, take it all the way through to completion. And that means being on set every day, hiring the crew, dealing with the crew, the cast, all the way through post, all the way through dealing with distribution and then marketing and kind of being involved in that. And Stark looks at producing that way. Obviously, Hollywood is, you know, not what it was in even the eighties and you have a lot of managers and things like that that slap their name on as producers. And there's been an effort to reduce that. Mm -hmm. But you still have movies where you look and you say, how on earth are there 30 producers on this thing? Right. A lot of it is who's bringing money, who was partners with the actor and all all this stuff. But at the end of the day, someone has to do the work. Um, And Stark does a good job of teaching you that process and navigating like NYU is a good film school. NYU does not teach you how to work within the Hollywood system. Right. USC, whether or not it's Stark or whatever it is, 
it is very much part of the Hollywood system and they teach you how to work in that system and how to advance in that system. And um, unless you want to be Jim Jarmus or Spike Lee and be doing these things off to the side, right. um, at some point you need Hollywood and you, you know, people can right. talk tough and act like they don't need Hollywood or they're too cool for it or whatever it would be. But right. at the end of the day, you need Hollywood. You, you, there have been many billionaires that have come in and tried to start distribution companies yep. Yep. and failed miserably. Yeah. Yep. It does not work. Beyond. There, there are things you need built over decades, which is the relationship with theaters and right. the staff to book your movies into theaters, which is a really underrated process in this whole thing. And right. some studios are better at it than others and, and getting movies that traditionally, you know, wouldn't hold week to week to say, well, if you want Harry Potter, you know, you need to have this movie in at least another week or two. And, and there, there's a lot. And like one of the reasons Lionsgate bought Summit was because of that. They they bought that library of Twilight and, and movies like that. So they can come in and say, do you want Twilight? Well, then you have to put this other small horror movie in for a month. Right. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces that go along with it. Um, you know, just making a movie is is, is so- grand. But, uh, but we, so the difference between that and screenwriting, obviously screenwriting is just writing. Um, right, right. Uh, do I think it's school is necessary to learn how to write? No. I no. think you either can tell a story and you can write snappy or good dialogue or prose, right. or you can't. No one can teach you how to write good prose. Exactly. They can point out your problems. Exactly. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of people go to screenwriting school and maybe they they think, oh, I'm going to be given this the key, the no. secret to figure out how to do this. But I think a lot just don't have the motivation necessary it's, to write. Everyone and, says like, everyone's like, how did you get a manager? How did, like, I have a manager now. I actually fired my agent uh, since the last time I spoke to you. I was rep by Paradigm. And um, I, I moved on. I moved on to John Levin. He's at Forward Management. Um, you know, he was an a-, a mega agent at CAA and he went and started his own shingle, um, with Will Ward. I don't know if you're familiar with these guys. I've been at a, a party at Will Ward's house. He was at another management company before that. Yeah. He's yeah. Married to, uh, yeah. Who was Channing Tatum's old agent. And I think he kept dragging her along. Um, yeah. 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 Liz, yeah. Maybe. I don't so, remember. Um, yeah, no. Like I, it, is it like everything else where it's just, it really is just all about networking and it's all that was my question know? to you. Yes, yeah, is, exactly. is it all yeah, about networking? Hollywood is so LA is so big, but Hollywood is so small. Right. It's so small. Right. Um, relationships matter. But so I kind of jumped over your question about is school relevant for me and how did it affect me? I came out of USC and Stark. And I was going to go off on my own. I had the rights to like three different book series. And I was like, right. I'm just going to push forward and try to get these set up because I don't want to be someone's assistant. I didn't go right. to film school to be an assistant. Right. I went to film school to be a producer. I went to producing school to be a producer. Right. So whether or not I'm going to make a $50,000 movie or a $50 million movie at, at a studio, that's what I'm going to focus on. Right. Um, and I had a part, uh, a classmate who was a close friend came to me and said, listen, I'm going to start a company. I'll pay you um, basically just to be there. I need a certain number of employees to uh, facilitate this this company because he was coming from overseas. Um, he's a UK citizen. He grew up in New York, but he's a UK citizen. So to stay in the state, he needed to start this company and have a certain number of employees. He's like, I'll give you health insurance and I'll pay you essentially minimum wage. And I said, okay, but if we're going to do it, let's just do it. Right. Like, like what, I'm going to sit there and do my own thing. It's, that's weird. You want to be doing, and we were, we were really close right. and we had the same taste. So I was like, let's just do it. And he's like, Oh, I didn't know you'd be into that. I was like, D- yeah, of course I'll be into it. Uh, and then we wound up, I, I hit the, so that was my first job out of there was I started a company from scratch. And then we built, we, we actually set out to do a live action film. We right. had about 400, 300, 400 grand, and we were going to go make a live action film. I went to every festival in the United States. Right. I hit up every filmmaker to say, send me your short, send me your feature, let me look at it. Right. You would be amazed at how many filmmakers don't have a follow up project ready to go. Yep. Or just, they, you talk to them for five minutes and you go, this guy cannot make a feature. I can't trust this guy with 400 grand, right. um, even if I'm running the show. 
Uh, so there were very few and far between. And then finally I saw an animated short and animation typically takes forever, especially back then. This is 2005. Right. I graduated in 2004. 2005, I saw, I was like, all right. And the guy said, let me come in with my partner and, and we'll meet you. And I was like, oh, okay. The short was really cool. They came in and our first question was, it was more of a meet and greet. I didn't really expect anything to come out of it because we weren't right. intending necessarily to do animation. And I said, how long did this take you? And he said, it took me a month. And that's in my spare time. He was working at Digital Domain as a VFX artist at the time. Wow. And I was, we looked at each other and we're like a month. And he's like, yeah, I was like, how, you know, and, and then it just snowballed from there. And we wound up building an animation studio from scratch in LA at a time when that just was not done. Uh, so, you know, independent animation was not happening in Hollywood no. at that level. Right. And we were it's, kind of the first. And then we did Battle for Terra, which is, uh, you know, premiered at Toronto, uh, which is the biggest fest in North America. Right. And then big, it's, it's different than, say, Sundance. Sundance is more of a critical thing. Toronto right. is more of a sales mega. festival with yeah, bigger mega. films. Right. Yeah. So now, is this is your company? You started Spokeland Entertainment with that with your friend from school? No. So, um, we were in production on Battle for Terra, and you know, animation is just a really long process. And once the first year was crazy, we were building an animation studio while we were doing the script and the animatic and the voice recording all at the same time. And once the studio was built and the film was in production and we were staffed you're talking about a minute every Monday and a minute on Friday that you get to watch. And then you're just kind of like an office manager. Right. So I was trying to be as active as possible. And I was reading every script I can get my hands on all these books that the rights were available. And, um, and then I had set up a project at Warner brothers called the Shannara series, mm -hmm. which is a big fantasy series. And like, once that happened, um, I sort of went off. I was, uh, I went off on my own. I, I broke away mm -hmm. and Battle for Terror finished. And those guys are awesome. They're killing it right now. Um, the, right. That company is called Snoot. Um, yeah, yeah, they okay. produced The Last Blair Witch and they yeah. they did Blind Spotting and The, uh, the Guest and You're Next. And wow. the, they're awesome. The like really good people and they know what they're doing. And um, I don't, I don't want to fast forward too much, but I mean, when I saw Beyond White, what you told me about Beyond White Space when we went out with John and the boys, we we went to um, Hurricanes for Wings and Beer. Yeah, for Joe's birthday. For Joe's birthday, I think it was his fortieth birthday, right? Yeah, he was turning yeah, forty yeah. then, right? Big shout out to Joe DeLeo. Um, and you told me we were talking about like the Revenant. I was telling you about my book career, and then you said I'm doing this movie called Beyond White Space, and it's like Moby Dick in space. It's about a bunch of like fishermen that are like, you know, uh, capturing these 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 you know dragons floating in the ether, and uh, you know I believed every word of it. And then like a year later, it's on fucking Showtime or something. Like it, I was like, yeah, well, that's right fucking Ryan. That, that was June. That was right. June. June. Um, that March, uh, we, you know, the film was rep by CAA. Yeah. So we had uh, a sales screening at the Grove in LA, which was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Not cheap, but the uh, CAA <laughs> has a theater. And they're right. like, well, it's, e it's easier to get buyers to come if it's at, you know, somewhere central. And so we're like, okay, let's do it. Uh, right. We had a buyer screening in, uh, the, at the Grove, which is at one point the highest, pro it's, the theater is awesome there. Um, it went well. There were a lot of buyers there. And then it was just a matter of fielding offers and seeing which one was the best for us. And right. uh, at the end of the day, we went with a company called Vertical Entertainment. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Which they've released a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Their, their model is limited theatrical with a focus on TVOD, which is transactional VOD. Sure. Um, and we wound up signing with them probably right after I saw you. Uh, it amazing. wasn't until say June or July. Um, and then the movie came out in December of 2018. Yep. And uh, one of the first license deals they made was with Showtime for an exclusive window. Um, so it, it had been out and I think it came out on Showtime last year in February, March maybe. And they had an exclusive window. I think they still do. 
take us back though. The, like, how did you how did you come up with this idea? It's a brilliant. It's Moby yeah, Dick. Did you did you produce it or would, did you have a writer? Yeah, I wrote, like, I wrote it. Right. Well, I did both. Um, okay. So what happened was uh, once I had left with you know, and to, to rewind a bit with uh, the Shanner situation, I was on the front page of Variety. The wow. uh, the book sold to Warner Brothers for a million dollars. Right. His book agent made 200 grand. I made zero. Yeah. But I thought I was hot shit. Right. I thought I was hot shit. I mean, I, I already thought I was hot shit. Right. Um, you kind of have like, to, you, you have to, to get to, it, it, may, it makes sense that you would think that you're hot shit because to be a fucking producer, you have to be hot shit. Sure. To some degree, I probably was a little uh, big in the britches, like, because there was no money involved. Right. right. Uh, if I was, had even gotten like a fifty thousand dollar check, like great, I could have spun that into a bunch of other things. Um, it, it definitely helped me. I mean, I, I have the rights with somebody else to one of George Martin's books, probably the wow. only one that's not controlled by HBO. It's amazing. Um, so what are you going to do with that? Um, I mean, we were kind of sitting on it and waiting for it to be more valuable. Right. Um, okay. and, and it keeps going up in value. Um, to be honest, I've been so busy. Uh, and the other guy uh, is not as, uh, so he's kind of taking the, the reins on that. Right. Um, so uh, there's a situation that's kind of percolating right now that I, I don't want to say because the person's not officially on board. Um, so don't jump, don't jump all over. I want to hear how beyond white space. Started. Yeah, I'm, I'm jumping all over. So no, no, so no, yeah, I, I went off on my own. I went off on my own and I was producing. Um, and I also write graphic novels, uh, right. and create graphic novels. Um, that's a big part of what I do as well. Right. Um, when you asked earlier, what, how many hats I wear, uh, it just seemed like a natural extension of what I was doing and also creating IP it's for amazing. things. So uh, with Battle for Terra, I had, there was, I, I shot a commercial. I directed and, and produced a commercial for a lacrosse company. Um, and the DP I used said, hey, I, I got this filmmaker. He has this really cool project that he teamed up with this visual effects studio on and the guy's cool. And so I met that director and, and to be honest, it was like, there's nothing there. Right. But the person I really hit it off with was the partner who owned the VFX studio. Um, at the time, I was playing lacrosse and training MMA, and um, he trained, he fought too. So we just, we like hit it off on a personal level. And then within like a week or two, that project was like in the rear view. And I was talking, I was meeting with this guy for like lunch and just BSing and talking about fighting. And uh, I said, what do you, what do you want to do? And he said, oh, you know, I really want to direct. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, he was 40 at 39 at the time. He's like, by the time I'm 40, I want to have a film that right. I directed. And I said, well, you know, let's do it. Like, let's figure out the idea. And he said, well, there's this one idea. I really, he's like, I just can't, I don't have the time to write. I, I can't write. Um, and he, I was like, what is it? He said, Moby Dick in space. Love he's it. like, I think yes. I could crush the VFX on that. Love it. And it's cool. And I was like, do you mind if I go off and, and, and develop it? Right. And he's like, no. And so I would check in every once in a while. And I, for me, the longest part of my process is the outline. Yep. Uh, once the outline's finished, my outline's usually like 30, 40 pages. Uh, yep. So it's really kind of filling in the blank uh, of dialogue and things like that. So I had the outline. And at this point, I forget what was happening, but I was, I, I was busy enough where I'm like, this script could take me too long. Um, and I had just had a book. I was on a book tour for a graphic novel called Harbor Moon that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And the, the reviewer from Fangoria had written me an awesome review and actually reached out to me and said, and Fangoria is like a pretty well-known publication. Mm -hmm. So I was psyched Fangoria that I got awesome. a good review. Yeah. And the guy wrote me and he said, hey, I also am a writer. I have a, you know, I know that you do movies. And I thought, you know, I know your background and are you interested in reading a, a script? Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, yeah, absolutely. Sure. I read this back and I was like, this is awesome. Um, 
I have, I have something for you potentially. Mm -hmm. Can't really pay you much, but here's the situation. I explained the situation, the VFX side of things and how, you know, we were just going to go. And he's like, read the outline. He's like, I'm in. So he had finished that in say like January. We were literally lending in June. It's amazing. So I, I, like he wrote the first draft and then I wrote, that's all I needed at that point. And then I rewrote it. Um, right. But it was, cause it was already like 30, 40 page outline. And then but, you he kind of like, filled in, he filled in a lot of blanks. Um, he did a lot of research on Moby Dick. He was awesome. Right. You know, what's um, so cool. And in fact, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. You can finish. I was going to say that in fact, the script that we had going into production was better than the script that went into production. Insane. You know, you know, it's so cool that you you honestly make it sound so easy. And I know I'm not saying that it's easy, but like you 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 give it you give such an aura that you're so confident in the matter, and it's just so matter of fact for you that this is your business, this is what you do, and you just you produce content in Hollywood, and like you're part of the system. And but that's I just want to mention, Eric, that's the Kaluchis. All right. right. I don't, yeah, no, no, Chris, I know, I know, I know. The Chris, you know, that I grew up with was so confident with going out and being friendly and being an extrovert. And when I met Ryan, it's like, they're destined for success, this family. They, they are. Right. I mean, right. what Ryan's, Ryan, just, Ryan's... The confidence, the confidence in it. And you're like, we've, everything. Been, like, we've been trying so hard to get, you know, the books done and to get the scripts done and, and like, you know, and it's, yeah, it's 10 years in a day to become successful. Sure. And, um, However, you guys are doing it, right? Yes. You have books that came out. You have books right, that yes. have gone, that are published, right? Yes. 99% of the people that I deal with, and probably even more than that, are full of shit. 100%. I have, 100%. Like, I mean, how many times as writers, probably people say the same stuff to you, but it's worse when you're, they know you're, say, a producer too. Oh, it's I like, had this great idea. Yeah, it's okay, bullshit. Cool. Go, it's, go you know it. what it is? I think, I think the, one, the, one that's piece exactly that missing, right. the one piece that we're missing, honestly, is, is the big make, sale. Is to make money. It's the, right. It's you know the big I mean? sale. It's to make well, the money on so it. So what I would say to that is it's, you can't look at it financially. Right? Like I, right, right. I knew, and I had a long talk with my dad when I came out of school, and this is before I even partnered up with this kid, and I said, listen, because yeah, you know, when I went to USC, my whole family was kind of like, He's rich now, you know, um, and it's just, it's not reality. And then when I came out, I said, listen, I, I'm going to go, go for this on my own, but it's going to be a slog and Absolutely. you just got to trust me and you got to trust that no matter how, how low I get in terms of finances, like I'm going to pull through this thing. And at, he knew at that point, um, I've always been extremely uh, organized and very anal and very, right success driven and, and very driven in general, um, that once I had made my mind up, like when I came, when I said, Hey, I want to go to film school. It was like, it was like, you know, devastating <laughs> on their faces, sure. on my parents' faces. But like, once they realized I was serious and I wasn't doing this to, you know, for, for, for laugh, yeah. they were all in on me. And, uh, it is a slog. And like, uh, so uh, the budget of white beyond white space is $937,000. Jesus Christ. Right. And how Which long, how relatively, long that how long? Yeah. Uh, time wise. Yeah. Ni 90 minutes, 90, okay. 90 yeah. minutes. So, but it, it's not about time. Um, unless you're talking about animation. Right. Um, which every single minute is, is a cost. Mm -hmm. There are 1500 visual effect shops in white space. Right. And it's, it's he as shot. good as, it's as good as alien covenant. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, the guy, it's as good as a guy was doing movie. effects yeah. for the matrix. Yeah. And Fight Club you tell. And things like that. Like, right. So the visual effects are, and, and I say this as a, as a writer of it are the best part of the movie. hundred um, percent. I agree. And but, the story was great. That, too. that was always going to be the case. And people are like, Oh, why did you work with this director? I'm like, I didn't work with this director thinking he was going to be the next Roman Polanski. Right. I did it because I was transitioning from like, so to put that in perspective, Battle for Terror, which is a CG movie animation. Right. It's a, it's 85 minutes. There are 2,400 shots in it. Now white space 
with Beyond White Space, which is a live action movie, has almost as many shots in it. Um, so that's how many visual effects shots are in Beyond White Space. That's and that's why I did that movie because it was a natural progression from Battle for Terra to that. Right. Um, the post, because of the way we structured it, the post took way longer than say a natural, like it naturally would because the way we were able to do it, and we shot on 35 millimeter, we didn't shoot digitally, um, right. which going back, I'd probably rethink that, but technology has advanced a little bit more. Right. Um, but it looks, it looks awesome. Um, do you only do space opera? Like, do you do only space no. opera stuff? Or? No, so Suburban Cowboy, uh, my first thing as a director, uh, the budget of that was 150 grand. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not a single visual effect shot in the entire movie. Right. There isn't even a visual effects cleanup shot in it. Right. Um, How much did that cost so you to make? He said 150 grand. 150 grand? Yeah. 156. Yeah. Um, so where do you get the fact, financing? Was, where do you get the financing for, that, for this? Uh, um, well, I think when you are like Battle for Terra, we had 300 to 400 to work with. Mm hmm. Um, coming out from my partner and then what we did is we put together the script the animatic and then a full scene and the animatic is basically the storyboards cut together as if it's a movie so you can sit and watch the movie um, which is essential for animation uh, right. and then we did a scene at full quality and back then like now it wouldn't cost anywhere near that back then you know we used a, a, a big chunk of that to make that happen um, mm -hmm. But we were able to take that, and this is when animation, no matter what was coming out theatrically, was killing it. Absolutely right. crushing because there wasn't a lot. Right. Um, so we were able to get our budget almost immediately for that. And that was initially like eight, eight and a half. And then we wound up up resing to 3D. Um, so it cost more. Mm -hmm. But that got us our theatrical on that. Um, do you prefer, film. Ryan, do you prefer... Um, write it getting the book first do you prefer getting the you know the intellectual property first or do you like the idea of writing a script and then putting it you know trying to sell it from there because right now you know I, my book Maslin is getting optioned a second time it was optioned a few years ago and the option ran out and now it's being optioned again um so what what do you do you like like the original seed of the idea and going from there or would you rather create the, the you know the, the the graphic novel or would you rather go you know work off of a of a novel um i think what you hear people say a lot and it's just kind of a buzzword that exec use because everyone is afraid to say yes uh because their jobs depend on it um right. is we we're looking for ip right right so but then you hear, oh, we're all looking for fresh new ideas. And yes. like, well, you just said you're looking for IP. So right. <laughs> are you looking for IP or are you looking for a fresh sci-fi idea? Right. Um, in general, I see, I grew up wanting to be a comic artist. Right. So the reason I do the graphic novel is less about that than it is about scratching that itch. Um, right. And with the graphic novels for me, as you guys know, there's a lot of waiting in, in uh -huh. Hollywood, even if you have, I have at any given point, 20 projects actively yep. happening in some capacity, right. even yep. if it's dealing with a writer or revising the script myself or doing a budget or a schedule or financing or, or whatever it may be. Right. Um, there is always, if I have, gra I have three graphic novels in production right now, right. There's always art coming in and that is satisfying. That's awesome. Um, That's incredible. Because you're always creating and then yes, they take time. But at the end of the day, like once it's done, it's like, it's done. It exists. Um, I was talking to a big filmmaker uh, and you know, this guy has directed some of the biggest horror hits in Hollywood in the last decade or so. Um, yeah. And he hit me up about helping turn his children's idea into a book. So uh, it, you asked me about financing, right? It, it's about, the battle for terror came fairly easily and it was almost too easy. Right. right. But, um, the, like white space, but beyond white space was all private equity. Right. We put together a perspective. We put together a deck. We 
we cobbled it together from like nine different investors. In fact, one of them went bankrupt about two weeks into our shoot. Oh my God. And so not only was I, and, and I was the producer on the movie. So I'm a small movie doing, trying to do big things. I'm spending half the day trying to scrape together more money uh, so then we, we can at least finish the shoot. And right. then you have these grumblings around set. They're not going to be able to pay us this week and all this, you know, and having to keep everybody like, no, no, we have enough money to pay you. Don't worry. If that's the case, we won't let you work. Um, mm. That was a hard one. That was really hard. And then figuring out how to scrape that together in post as we were going and the director wanted to be, you know, his company to be paid something, but we were really working on the backs of other jobs. That was always mm -hmm. the plan. So, you know, say he got a job for a big movie that like, just for an example, like Hellboy, right? right. And it was X was amount of him. dollars. I watched that the other day. It was a great movie. <laughs> the uh, Hellboy, actually Hellboy 2 was one of the films that we worked on the back of. So, uh, really? yeah, like, hey, we're going to pay you this. And we need these shots done in a month, right? Mm -hmm. And those shots can be done in a week, but the facility and the people are being paid for another three weeks. So rather than like push for other jobs to come in back to back to back, it'd be, all right, we're going to take those three weeks and work on Beyond White Space. Right, um, I see. And that's how we were able to do a really massive looking movie for a small amount of money. Now, if we didn't shoot on 35 millimeter, that budget would be, a, you know, two thirds of what it costs. So here's um, the, here's the question. Did you learn that in school or did you learn that in the real world? Like, cause like I would have never thought that, that you, that you, you know, you did work on Hellboy too, that it, you, you had money for a month, you know, like, ha, like had I mean, it back. No one can teach you that. Right. Right. Like, you can't right. be taught that. Um, that was a lot of, you know, that's, that's a lot of the New Yorker in me. Um, right. And, and to his credit, the director saying, here's a situation, you know, we can make this work because of this. Um, and me being a little bit more kind of loose and gung ho and saying, yeah, fuck the system. Right. Um, it, <laughs> but, you know, we don't answer to anybody but our investors and really to ourselves. Um, right. You know, we, here's the plan we're going to follow. And, you know, the investors signed off on that. And, and do you have an agent? Go. Ryan, do you have, you an know, agent? because, no, because I've actively been more of a producer than anything. Right. And I've had discussions about it with some of the bigger agencies. Right. But at the end of the day, um, I was always more of a producer. And now I've been more of a director uh, writer. Right. So I've, I'm actually there are two that I have been talking to um, in the last month or two. So I have a project that actually supposed to go in August. It's supposed to be one of the first ones out of this pandemic. Right, right. It's a really contained sci-fi film. Great. And, you know, there's three actors in one space and it can be small cast, small crew. Mm -hmm. um, and the director that I was just talking about um, just came on. He's, a, he's like a mentor to me, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, we met through being out, but which is odd because usually when you meet somebody out and drinking and partying, it doesn't, no, nothing pans in out. Hollywood. <laughs> right. It, it, well, yeah, they, they look at you that way. They don't look at you as a serious person right. that works, but to go back to like, how do you get financing on stuff when they see, holy cow, like this guy is just cranking like things and not that I'm, I just throw things against the wall and see if it sticks. But like the things I'm cranking out, he keeps right. He'll write me and be like, this is awesome. Right. This, like my, uh, hand-drawn animated thing orient city uh he was a part of in terms of like the kickstarter that i ran a few years ago right and i wound up winning like you know 25 awards and, and things like that he was like I, how can i be involved in this stuff so i think you just the more you you're, create you're in fucking more beast mode. you're in beast mode dude I mean, you, there's nothing like how, how big do you want to go? Do you want to get the Spielberg status? Do you want to be well, the next Tarantino? Like wh where do you, where can you? Uh, Tarantino does not active enough for me. Um, I <laughs> like the person that I look at right now, and it's not that I love his movies or, or anything like that. The person I look at in terms of, all right, he's doing a lot. He has his finger on everything. It's JJ Abrams and bad robot. Sure. Yeah. Um, yep. 
you know, he's doing big things and I'll do small things and he's doing TV and yep. uh, he's got his fingers on everything. Yes. And that to me is interesting. Um, That's awesome. I had a, a financier come to me and say, Oh, how, how are you going to do this? Like it was an animated project. How are you going to do this animated project while you're doing that an animated project? And I was just, you know, how do you answer that? Like I, I, I am, right. if you're not going to watch me, if you're not going to be a part of it, you're going to watch me do it. So um, you're an inspiration for everyone, Ryan, for real. I, you, uh-huh. You're, you're, you know, you should, you'd be like motivational. You should consider writing a book on how to break in because a lot of people or I get start, this, start a podcast or start a podcast. Well, Ryan, your, your story is fascinating. Because you can bring such interesting guests on the working side of Hollywood. If you bring those people in on how movies are made and just from that type of um, connection, like having a podcast will only raise your profile. 100, 110%. You, you know what you learn more from than, than like the, the cheery feel good stuff is the shit that went wrong. Of course. Yes. Um, yes, 100%. And all, all of the all of the things that I've taken away more so than anything, like if like Battle for Terror, everything pretty much went right. Right. I learned how to. I I didn't know anything about creating visual effects, but I had right. to. For I had to. The one thing I had to do was figure out how do I build an animation studio from scratch. Right. We were. You talk about what do you learn in film school, and is that applicable? <laughs> There's no film school in the world that teaches you how to, uh, you know, at the, to, you have to render all the animation that gets done or the effects that get done. So you need a render room or a render right. farm. At that point, you know, we're talking about 2005. That render room is, you know, 20 by 20 with like 400 nodes in it, 400 computers. So right. what we had to figure out wasn't, oh, how do we make, how do we, you know, uh, it's not eating uh, craft services with a movie star. It's right. how much, uh, how big of an air conditioner do we need to cool this render form so it's 65 degrees? Right, right. Okay, it's 15, ton, we need a 15 ton con- condenser. Okay, where do we get that? Okay, can we get one cheaper, maybe used? And we were in the Samsung building in LA. I don't know if you've ever been to LA. It's on Wilshire and La Brea. Sure. It's one of the big yeah. tallest buildings in LA. It's yeah. that big Samsung sign on the top, right? We're on the second floor. <laughs> so now we need a 15-ton condenser. All right, how are we going to get it? How are we going to do this? We had to get a crane to drop it on the roof. We had to get, part, like, oh the things God. that, like, it's, you know, we're talking about construction stuff and, and, and right. figuring out engineering on how to cool a room. There's no film school in the world you're going to learn that. So but now wait, I know how to, but I've like, gone through that stuff, right? So it helps. And now when there's no way, and, and as a producer, I said to myself, if I'm going to do this thing, what I don't ever want to be in is a situation where someone knows more than me. As right. a producer, I should know every single job down to the last inch on a set. Right. And I made it a point to, to do that. Yes, the DP is obviously more skilled than me at lighting. But there's no situation where he's going to come to me and say, oh, well, I need this and I need that. And you're not going to know what the fuck he's talking about. Yeah. Right. I get it. I have a question. So, like, Um, how does that compare to today? Like you said, you know, the, you know, the, you know, technology is obviously I don't I don't want to, you know, talk out of my ass or anything. But, you know, do you just need a MacBook today or just, you know, one of those five thousand dollar Macs, ten thousand dollar Macs to to render the, you know, to render that graphics now? Yeah. To some degree, you still need, um, you can render over a cloud, right. cloud exactly. rendering services. So right. what, what my part, my partner is in Budapest, his name is Jean Borahuska, um, and he's who I started out doing the books with. And then we started doing animation actually for Suburban Cowboy, my film as a director. Um, I, I was like, yeah, $150,000 film. How do we get this thing to stand out a little bit? Right. Um, you know, yeah, it could be good, but it's still very micro. Um, right. And I was like, you know what? We have this, ex- we have this ability. We have this, like, let's do hand-drawn animated opening title. Did hand-drawn animated opening titles and everyone's like, oh, it's the best part of the movie. Uh, and they're right. They're awesome. Uh, just because they're really unique. And I was like, you know, maybe, maybe other people think this way. I looked and South by Southwest has it, a title sequence award. And so I applied to it with those. We get in, 
and I'm like, oh, it's going to be a bunch of other indies. It's this is South by Southwest, so it's it's suburban cowboy title, right? Spectre, it, Avengers: Age of Ultron, oh, Daredevil, God. and like something <laughs> some other insane and you know everyone knows James Bond's title sequences are sick, right? So and we're up against those, and you know it's me and my partner from Budapest who did these on our own. Uh, so after that happened uh, and just seeing those and then a lot of people were contacting us like, Hey, did, did you win? These are, these are cool. Did you win? No, we didn't win. Oh, no, we didn't fuck. Win. Um, but, but just that alone gave us the confidence to say, all right, we have something here, which then gave us the confidence to put Orient city into production as at least a short, like right. do a show reel. And that got an investor on board to then finance, all the way through prep on a series, which we're in production on now, um, which is, you know, the scripts and the animatic and all the character designs and everything like that. Right. Um, so like each little step gets you to the next step. And the more you do that people notice, the more they come to you and say, what else do you have? Like right. Orient City got my buddy um, who I view as a mentor. I've been dying for him to be like, hey, I'd love to work with you on something. Came to me and said, I'd love to work with you on something. Right. And so I have this film, this film that um, I said, well, this is my next thing up. He ready. He's like, I am in. He's like, I want, I'm starting to use my leverage as a producer. Right. Um, my director cloud as a producer. And he made one of the top 10 highest grossing films of all time relative to budget. It's um, amazing. And he's like, Ra this is awesome. Let's do it. We have. I know, no, no, it's all good. We, Eric and I actually, we've been on, we've been doing video calls since this whole pandemic thing. I want you on as a guest again. This has to be continued. I have a thousand other questions I have to ask. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You, yeah, we you, have, we have another call in five minutes. We have another call in five minutes. With oh, actually, I'm sorry. No, no, it's all good. With another, with actually a studio, but not related to anything book wise. It's about, wise their, about wise. their ground transportation. It's about their limo service. What they're, what, the, what they wow. need. What we're doing in the post COVID era, but. I have, I have one more question for you. You're a movie guy. Um, top five movies of all time. Go. Fight Club, Rad, Godfather, and I'm not splitting them up. Godfather 1, Godfather 2. Understood. Understood. Uh, and, oh, man. Um, I would say Empire Strikes Back. It's a good, and, good list. Really good pie. list. And Good list. I haven't seen uh, Pi is what got me into film. Pi is what got me into like made me gave me the confidence to make the jump into filmmaking. I have to check that out. I'm watching Ran now. Uh, Kira Kurosawa's um uh, Ran. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit! I started it last night. I have about like a half hour to go. But oh my god, there you want two, to? Talk? Yeah, it's awesome. There are two films that got me to be like, wait a second, I can do this. It was Pi and Brothers McMullen. Really? Both were done for, say, the pie was 60 grand, um, shot in Brooklyn with, uh, you know, Darren Aronofsky. Right. Uh, on reversal film stock. And then Brothers McMullen was 25 grand. Right. Ed Burns, Irish Catholic from Long Island. Right. Just went and made a movie. And that's what was like, wait a second. Would you, would you come on our podcast again? Because I literally have a million other yeah, questions to ask you. Uh, Ryan, this was all awesome. set up a time. Definitely. And where could tell our audience where they could find you, how they can contact you, like put it out into the universe. Uh, I'm on the, the thing I use most is Instagram and okay. it would be at spoke lane S P O K E L A N E. Right. Um, and then, you know, my website, because I was getting deluged with submissions, I actually took it down and now it's just a banner. It's just a spoke lane logo. But mm -hmm. if you click the logo, it'll pull up uh, an email address. Um, awesome. But I was getting crushed at, you know, I have only so much. I'm one. I read everything that comes in. Sometimes really? That's if awesome. I get something, I'll read it. Yeah, I don't so, believe in readers. Listen, Ryan, please send Michael your headshot. Um, so yeah, we, yeah, I will. We can put this up or just Ryan, hang up. Don't don't hang up, Ryan, because we're gonna yeah. end the podcast now. Like, subscribe, le like, subscribe, leave comments down below. Ryan Colucci, the bomb dude. You want to get into Hollywood? Listen to this fucking kid. Thanks, everybody. I know exactly what he was doing. Ryan, thank you, bro.